know, I, I, grew, up, I grew up as a television child. I, I watched television instead of doing homework. My, my <laughs> parents used to say to me, if you don't do your homework, you'll never amount to anything. And what can you do in television? And I think that that question, well, I'll show you. And, and uh, homework was my television. Uh, I, I learned story. I learned the difference between good and evil. And uh, it taught me an awful lot. Uh, the school taught me a little. And, and uh, so I guess I was a true child of TV. That's when I knew. You had a lot of success. Was it hard for you to break into the business, or were you one of the lucky ones who really got in right away? Lucky, very lucky. Uh, what happened was I, I was. Um, I started to write. What I found about writing was that people who talk about writing are not writers. They, they talk about it. You know, writers write. It's solitary, it's lonely, you face that blank page, blank screen. And I wrote a play, and the play went to Broadway. I opened, I was 22 years old, and um, the play ran, but a fellow from NBC named Josh Kane was in the audience. And he said, you know, the play's a situation comedy. Okay, and he said, you should write for television. And I said, okay, he could, he could have said anything. He had a job, he was at NBC. They were paying me $400 a week on Broadway. He told me what they would pay to write a pilot script. And I said, I'd, I'd like to try. Um, Josh let me write two or three pilot scripts every year for a few years. And um, then, I went to a company called Scholastic and wrote a pilot uh, called Charles in Charge. And Charles in Charge went immediately. Um, it, was, it was really an interesting story. The um, person running CBS at the time was named Harvey Shepard. Harvey Shepard has a daughter, Greer Shepard, who's in the business, does very well. And uh, Harvey had what we call a tell. Uh, a, a, a tell is you can pitch to an executive and he can tilt his head a certain way or he can raise or lower an eyebrow and you know the pitch is over. Harvey's tell was when his hand dropped and touched the, the, the desk. His hand would drop, his hand would drop, you were good, you were okay, you could bring his hand back, but if his hand touched the desk, you knew it was, you know, I, I, we have something like it, no. So we, we pitched Charles in charge, we went and pitched it, and I'm talking about this student nanny. And I was talking about what I wanted to write about, which was that there's an eternal triangle in my mind, and that triangle is a best friend and a girlfriend, and a kid torn in the middle. That applies to most everything you just saw. And, and what is my allegiance to my friend? What is my allegiance to love? You know, does love happen early? And Harvey's hand is and love is a thing, and what happens is this girlfriend is so good looking, and she's built beautifully, and, and I wanna focus on that. And he, he gave me the, the pilot script, and we wrote it. And then uh, the pilot was rejected, uh, and another pilot was rejected that year, called Two Mommies. And a fellow named Al Burton called me and said, I've read your pilot scripts, because by then I had a stack. And he said, would you like to come out to Los Angeles and <coughs> try your hand at, at writing with me? And I said, sure. And I flew out to Los Angeles, and he wanted to do a show called Off the Beam, which was a show about gymnasts, okay? And I said, then it should be called On the Beam. And he <laughs> said, but no, Off the Beam, you see, that's the subtle dichotomy if it's called off the, I said, did you read Charles in Charge? And he said, no. And I said, forget about off the beam. Read Charles in Charge. He read it, he said, this is really good. And I said, call Harvey and tell him you think it's good. And he called Harvey and he said, yeah, it had some problems in the second act. Could you cast it and fix those problems? And so we, we uh, set about to rewriting the second act. And a producer, another producer, named Moore Lockman, also had second act problems, in Two Mommies. They changed the title of Two Mommies to Kate and Allie, and uh, Charles in Charge set about to find its Charles. Um, second act completed and better. Uh, we went to Michael J. Fox, and Michael J. Fox was on a about to be canceled show called Family Ties. Uh, that was gonna be canceled, Cheers was gonna be canceled, it all was gonna be canceled because it was all ranked around 100, 110 that year. 
And um, a fellow at uh, ABC named Lou Erlett had a pilot that he didn't like either. And that starred Bill Cosby, who he felt would not be able to control an audience. His last show only did okay and ran three years. He's a jello pudding pops guy. And so Brian Tartikoff, who I have always felt was a genius, said, you know what? I'm going to take that pilot. I'm going to keep Family Ties. I'm going to keep Cheers. Reinhold Wiege wrote a show called Night Court. I'm going to put that together. And NBC had must-see television for the next 25 years. Uh, Michael Fox was gone. He read the script. He loved it. And he said, I'll be your Charles. And Michael's gone. And uh, Happy Days gets canceled. And I say to Al, Scott's available. We show Scott the script, he loves it, and he's our, he's our Charles, Harvey is happy, and the show has a nice, long, successful run. And, and that's how I broke into television. Um, you launched a lot of careers. I think they got to see Meg Ryan up there, um, we saw Ben Affleck. Is there anyone you remember working with um, and you thought, that, person, that person's gonna make it? Um, the Meg Ryan story is, is, a, is really a good story. Uh, she came in, to audition for, for Charles's girlfriend, Gwendolyn Pierce. And there was something about her rhythm that just struck, she, she walked with a, there was a hilt in her walk, a hilt in her delivery. She would just pause before hitting, she, she did exactly what she not only needed to do, but needed to do to be separated from any other actors. And she had this, her hair was like a daisy, it was bright yellow, uh, uh, wonderfully bubbly, and I said, would you wait in my office? And all she had done was, as the world turns, and Amityville 3. And, and I, she said, of course. I ran out of my office at Universal. I ran to the, two, the, the Black Tower. A guy named Bob Harris was running Universal Television. I run up to his office. It's one of those bad scenes in an MOW where, where I went past the secretary. Hey, you can't go in there. And I go, Bob, I got, an, I got, a, I got a billion dollars in my office. And he says, I'm in a meeting. I said. Billion, and he said, uh, we don't make development deals. I said, all of these are the wrong answers. Billion dollars, real talent in my office. We need to lock up this girl. And, and uh, he said, well, I'm not gonna do it. I said, why, because I broke up your meeting? And he said, yeah. I said, well, you're chapter 14 in the book. And I went back <laughs> and, and, and uh, uh, I said to Meg, we want to cast you. And we did. And um, Meg ended up having one more season of As the World Turns in her contract. And I thought, well, we want to put her on. This is terrible that they would do that. It happened again with an actor who had one more episode of television. And that same Brandon Tartikoff said, I don't care that you just got James Bond. You have one more episode of Remington Steel to do. And so Pierce was not able to do James Bond until the contract ended, and then they got around to give it to him. So it's amazing the things that can happen in an office. Um, the best news Meg Ryan ever got was that she didn't become a regular on Charles and George. But she did do two or three episodes for us, which she will deny if she was sitting next to me. We had proof up there. So. Me too. Um, looking back at, at all the diverse shows you've done, is there any that maybe didn't resonate with audiences that you were really surprised about that just didn't stick? Um, you know, I've done 15 television series. Uh, four of them were what I would consider to be hit television shows. It's a good batting average. But there were a couple of them that I thought were as good or better uh, than some of the shows that became hits. Um, a couple of them I put up on the reel. I thought Lost at Home, which, which ran uh, eight, eight or nine episodes, um, it got great numbers. Uh, and I'll be completely frank and honest. Um, the, the show um, played with Jim Belushi's show, uh, according to Jim. Uh, it tied its number, tied its number. Uh, I got a call that said, if you come within 25% on the next airing of the number you've been getting, we're gonna pick up the show. Beat the number. And the audience really liked Lost at Home. Uh, Michael Eisner was running Disney and uh, said, more Jim Belushi. 
And so what you got was, I forget the name of the show, but the guy, the, 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 the you all love television, that's why you're here. It was a show, the guy was, uh, it was sitting in his little rubber pool, shooting a water gun at the camera. It, it was just like Jim Belushi, Rodney, it was according to Jim and Rodney's whatever. It ran four episodes. Uh, that was the same season that, that Disney decided to put um, uh, Millionaire on five days a week. <laughs> Decisions are made that seem relevant and correct at a time that shows trend, but sometimes the trend is at its peak and you don't know it. I believe that Lost at Home would have run a good long time. Uh, I believe that the Torkelsons, which NBC absolutely loved, uh, got numbers, did great. Um, ran uh, next to Golden Girls. Um, but it was a rural <laughs> show. And it was the same thing. Mike Dan used to run uh, CBS and said, uh, we're rural, we're Beverly Hillbillies, we're Green Acres, we're, we're, we're Hee Haw. Change it all. And the following year, you had, you had in, in August, you had the reruns of Green Acres, Beverly Hillbillies, Hee Haw, and the like. And in September, you had Mary Tyler Moore, All in the Family, New Heart, and, and in, a new dynasty was born. It was a very good decision there. Um, I think the decision to take a show off the air because it has a rural feel uh, is, is a mistaken decision. I think that the, the characters in the Torkelsons, and it was a show that somebody came to me with. It, it, it wasn't of my own devising, but I fell in love with these characters. And the, the response we were getting from a broad-based audience, the numbers were terrific. We held with gold <laughs> Um But it was rural. And so they said, look, we're going to give you a chance. Citify it. And so we pulled it into a major city. I, I, I pulled it into the most rural major city I could. Um, we added Perry King. We added Brittany, God rest her soul, who is a was a good luck charm for me always. And she, she's done four or five television shows for me. And um, the last thing she did for me was Boy Meets World. She played a character called Trini. And, and uh, Brittany and I stayed in touch. She went on to, to uh, voice for Mike in, um, why am I blanking, the animated show. Uh, I can't remember. Brittany did the young girl in an animated show of voice. But, it, but uh, Rock came to hell. And, and uh, was taken from us too soon. Um, to, to answer your question, there was a fellow who used to always come into the office, always, very young. He also had, like Meg Ryan, a real odd timing. And I thought, boy, this, this guy is, is real. And I just, I didn't have anything for him. And I always liked him. I sort of tracked him. And he, and he did an episode of Charles and George for me. And that was Matt Perry. And, and, uh, so, and you saw Ben on Almost Home. But all through, you know, you do a lot of television shows. We did a, a show. I did a pilot. There was a pilot in trouble, and they called me to help. It was for Sinbad. The, the, the comedian, and, and um, we cast uh, a, a young woman who was, when I say right off the boat, literally right off the boat, new to the country, did not speak, I spoke a whole thing English. There was something compelling about her, and that was Salma Hayek, and, and we put her in, in the pilot of, of Sinbad. So through a career, you get to meet an astonishing level of talent, and talent rises. Boy Meets World, um, there was so much emphasis on the classroom, Mr. Feeney. Was, I mean, the classroom is pretty much a character um, in itself. So many teen shows sort of try to shy away from being in the classroom, being in the school. Why was that so important to you? Well, I grew up with Head of the Class, Welcome Back, Cotter, and, and, and shows that were set in the classroom and did very well being set in the classroom. My, my, I, I, my head is saying, say the word, my philosophy. It doesn't seem right for me. But my, my leaning was, you know, a workplace comedy is set in the workplace. If you're doing a comedy with kids, their workplace is the schoolroom. I also feel that um, I was such a terrible student. I was so, so I mean, terrible doesn't really dis describe. I was, I was, I would get an A in English and make up book reports. The teacher would say, read, the, I'd make up the book, the book, the <laughs> author, and I'd make it up, and they knew it, and I thought I was putting something over on them, but the, the cleverness was good enough for a grade. Uh, English and history, AA, everything else, D plus. 
D plus because they like me as a person. <laughs> well, but D plus, and I've written monologues about this. D plus, what kind of grade is D plus? What is a D plus? You stink plus. <laughs> a little bit better than you stink. Yeah, but how do you do that to a kid? What's, what's the difference between a D plus and a C minus? You're average less. You stink plus. They need to abolish D plus. I think it, I think it works. <laughs> In any event, that's why you said it. You, you said you said a show in the classroom because it's what kids know, and nobody responds neutrally to a classroom. You know, you either love it or you hate it, and I hated it, and so I wanted to use it to my advantage. Uh, do any of your characters are they true to your heart? Um, where it's maybe a part of you in that character? Well, they are so true to my heart, and so part of my heart that a lot of them are sitting behind you all. Uh, I think Ben and Ryder and Trina and Maitland, I think, I think a lot of the Boy Meets World cast is sitting in the back row. Um, I don't think that any of us would miss any, any part of each other's lives. I think that you, know, you, you, you meet people and you fall in love with them as family and you want them to be part of your lives but life takes over. Um, Ryder came to uh, the, the, the shoot of uh, Girl Meets World, the pilot shoot, and he, he brought his fiance. And I was in the middle of scene changes, script changes, uh, well, well, set changes, and I, my head told me, this is Ryder's fiance. This is the woman he's gonna spend the rest of his life with. And I said, hi, you got a great guy, and went back to the set. And as I was going back to the set, Make sure you pull her away, and to, and I never got a chance to. And all I've done is apologize to Ryder, and and I was looking forward to coming to Austin because I knew that she would be here, but she's not, and so <laughs> it still goes unfulfilled. But it's a, it's an excuse for dinner, certainly. <laughs> uh, this morning in the Boy Meets World panel, you talked a lot about spirituality um, and sort of sending messages that you felt were important. Did that ever hinder you? Because you know a lot of shows today, they don't touch on that. Yeah, it has. Um, but when you say, does it hinder you, it, go, it plays right into a belief system. You know, um, the, the, the advice that I would give anybody is that a particular core belief system is the most wonderful thing you can have. Right up until the point that you realize, you talk to people and they will say, yeah, religion is the cause for all wars, religion is, you know, and I say, like I say about other things, have you read the book? And, and, <laughs> and so what you, what you get is, no, because it's a, you read the book, it's a wonderful book. And, and so I was very attracted to the book, to the extraordinary dysfunction between people in the, in the beginning of the book, to the fact that heroes are flawed to, to, to playing in to my particular belief system so much that I realized, well, it's really a communal belief system. And so finally, I got off of my little high horse, which was, boy, I believe in something, to we believe in something. And then when you get to we believe in something, why is it necessary that you and I are better believing it than just me or just you? And so you get a congregation, and you get a community, and you get a room, and, and, and you get a world. Um, that should be written to. It shouldn't be preached. It's, it's t television is designed certainly to entertain. But the problem is the level of entertainment finally has to be, look, you're going to get what you tolerate. You're, you're, you're gonna, if, if, if producers feel, why do we have to get writers to write scripts? Why do we have to hire actors? We can give you reality. It can cost a dollar and a half. And if you tolerate it, you're gonna get it. And I have to say, at the risk of a controversy, you deserve what you tolerate because nobody is looking to spend money on you. But if you make them, if you make them, you'll get mad men. You'll get, you, you'll get on networks again what cable is giving you. And I, I, I think you should make them. Because I think that we've leveled down. 
Um, I, I think that there's wonderful things on television. But if we want to go back to Cheers and Family Ties and Night Court and, and Cosby, I don't see it. I, I'm a half hour guy. I don't see it. I, I, I admire 30 Rock, uh, I, but that was a loss leader for NBC. Um, but I would say to you that people that genuinely want to write dialogue, there's a fellow sitting in the back of the room named Tim Doyle. And Tim Doyle was a writer that I, that I like to think uh, I, I helped the beginning of his career. Uh, Tim, you saw the clip from Dinosaurs. Tim wrote a lot of those lines. <laughs> And um, this, the, Tim, as well as the rest of the staff of Dinosaurs, Victor Fresco, Rob Eulin, Ka Dave Kaplan, Brian LePan, uh, on and on, I know I'm missing people, but, but uh, they've all done remarkably well. We all cared about, it, you know, Ted Harbert was running ABC, he called me, he said, over my dead body, are you killing that baby dinosaur? <laughs> he said, why would you do something like that? And I said, I don't know, history says they went extinct. <laughs> and he said, well, you're not doing it. And I said, all right, and I won't. And, and of course, we hang up the phone, and we do. Because the job of the good writer is to hang up the phone and then do it. The job of the good audience is to appreciate it. And I think that Tim and I think that I have always appreciated any audience response to something we genuinely thought was good. Dinosaurs were, were in fashion. Um, could we Hensonize dinosaurs? And um, that was what he was thinking about, and he passed away. And Brian came into my office and said, my dad had an idea about a, a blue-collar dinosaur family. And I think that they were thinking about the, the formula that would have brought you the Cramdens uh, which is the same formula that brought you the Flintstones, which is the same formula that brings you anything down the line if you go through it. Um, and I didn't want to do that formula. Uh, what I wanted to do was, I, I hit upon the idea that wouldn't it be funny if the real reason for the extinction of the dinosaurs was that they started to marry and have children. <laughs> and so I thought that, let's make the metaphor that the rise of families in the world will lead to our ultimate disposal and doom. It was the opposite of what I believed, but I knew it was funny. So I went back, I went back to Brian and I said, I want to try this, and he said, really? Because I, I don't know that it's something that the Hensons would, but I got Tim and the rest of the staff that, you know, I don't even know that Tim knows this, but when we were looking for these writers, we were looking for exactly a counterculture type of staff. And we got one, and the stuff that we did, Bob Young, uh, leading that staff with me. Um, and, I, and I really have to be very deferential to Bob because I had other shows on the air. And as soon as we got the template of dinosaurs, which I guess was kid doesn't recognize father as a living being, father throws kid against the room, um, <laughs> got it, go. Uh, I was able to leave that room in spectacular hands and, and um, at the end came back and said, we're gonna kill him. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a problem doing so. And I, I thought that the, the rationale for it was the show quickly became, uh, and Tim, if, if, I'm, if I'm talking out of turn, just stand up and shout me down, but the, the, uh, the um, show became an environmental darling. All of a sudden, you know, that we say so corporation was knocking down trees. We were receiving environmental media awards. We were getting tremendous accolades from parents group, from the United States military branches, all of them, for an episode which was uh, Jason Alexander voiced, uh, his name was Harris, uh, Monica de Vertebrae was the first female dinosaur in the workplace. Uh, he started throwing uh, sexual comments at her. 
uh, and Earl started calling him sexual Harris, and Roy, his friend, would always say, I wonder what sexual Harris meant. And so, <laughs> and, and so we were able, and what was funny about it was designing women, because the Clarence Thomas issue was, was in the air, designing women was able to do it, but they did it with human beings. So, so there was a soapbox, and, and all of a sudden, it's you know, the designing women, it was Anita Hill, right? So, so we're on the side of Anita Hill, uh, Clarence Thomas villain, blah. We decided not to go that route. We didn't have cartoon characters, but we had the benefit of being able to go immediately over the top. And so what happened was we had Senate hearings, we had, um, they were puppets for the most part, but the Senate, we put the puppets on actual marionette strings to show that the Senate was a puppet. We were able to do things like that and we didn't have to write to it. We could just show you. So this led to the end. And at the end, I felt, if we are an environmental darling, and we don't say that we're destroying this world, and if we don't use the metaphor and use the line, we've been here hundreds of millions of years, we're never going away, and show our own arrogance, we're missing an opportunity. And of course, the room debated, you know, we're gonna go out with the most dreary, tragic, <laughs> All it is is talked about. That's what's talked about, that episode. Yes, not the mama. Yes, I'm the baby, God love me. <laughs> but, that, but that episode is what is all over the internet, and we're extraordinarily proud that we did do that. What astonishes me to this day is that the graphic Howard Hand Up Me can come up, and, and I remember Brian's face when he said, you can't name this character Hand Up Me. And I said, Brian, people don't know? And he went, okay. The, 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 the Muppets were, were not puppetry. But we had a couple of hand puppets. So he said, you can only name a hand puppet hand up. <laughs> Those were the rules. What I look for is when I write a character, someone to walk in and show me that I am absolutely wrong in everything that I'm thinking this character must look like or sound like. Um, uh, I told the story this morning, I don't know if you're at that panel, Ryder Strong walked in, uh, he was the first one of hundreds of people to walk in, and we, we were done. Uh, when it's right, it's right. Uh, again, Meg Ryan walks in, Matt Perry walks in, Ben walks in, Brittany Murphy walks in, these people walk in, that's, that's easy. The, the tough one is to cast somebody to be a lead in a television show like Mitch Rouse. You all recognize Connie Britton, but I don't know that you will all recognize Mitch Rouse. Mitch Rouse is a spectacularly funny, personable, compelling series lead. Um, he hasn't had the opportunity past Lost at Home. He's writing now, he's, he's doing fine. Um, the tough one is to put somebody in front of you who you genuinely believe in, and for whatever reason, it doesn't work. And you have to think, have I made the mistake? And I watch that from the back of the room, and I'm able to say, no, I didn't make the mistake. Um, the, 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 the clever answer is not the right answer to your question. The answer is, you have to trust your instinct. You have to know that whether or not the other people in the room believe so, you find something compelling and you push a button. Anyone else? Yeah. I, I'm just wondering what you enjoy most about writing and creating television. Um, I, I, Tim, do you enjoy anything about writing? <laughs> <laughs> you do? Yeah, the other writer. Yeah, the other writers is exactly right. Tim is running the uh, uh, Tim Allen Show. Um, and and, and um, I, I think that uh, Tim's presence in a room is exactly what he says. The writer's room is the greatest thing about writing anything. It is a bunch of uh, sometimes like-minded, sometimes completely diverse personalities, but all trying to achieve one thing, which is to entertain you guys. That's the fun of it. But facing a script that is already written and going into rewrites is a lot more fun than facing that blank page and having nothing. 
um, uh, putting together a television show. Once the script, once you're confident in it, putting together the show is the most, I wish it on all of you, the most joyous thing you can do. The personalities involved, those people sitting in the back of this room, to get to know them, to spend, it's like spinning balls of light, you know, their talent. And that they all work to one goal, which is nobody will do anything uh, Ben's going to get mad at me, but you know what, by the time he runs up and steals the microphone, it, it, I'll have already said I cast Fred in an episode, and, and, and uh, Fred was, um, he was a villain. Uh, he hit on Topanga, he was a college professor, he, 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 he betrayed his trust, and he hit on Topanga, and I wanted Ben to hit on him. I wanted him to actually punch him through the wall in the student union. And Ben said, I will not hit my brother. And I said, he's not your brother. <laughs> he's this really bad guy who did this to you. And Ben said, I will not hit my brother. And I said, would you shove him through a wall? <laughs> and he said, I would be glad to shove my brother through a wall. <laughs> so there are rules. Sitting here today, um, if you had to look at the guy who made Charles in charge, what advice would you, would you give yourself back then? Um, I would say at the, the, the unfunny, I'm sorry, it's easy to do a funny one, but I would tell, I would tell that guy, um, the funny one was don't do the Sinbad show, but the, but the, un, <laughs> the, 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 un, the unfunny real one, you, you've got to hold to that core belief system. If, if you write what you don't believe, it, it will, and I didn't know it then because there was no internet. Charles in Charge, that guy, he didn't know that Perez Hilton has already been writing about all of these panels. It's already all over the world. The Boy Meets World panel, uh, the one after that, all of the other shows, so he's already ranked them, reviewed them, spoken about them. It's out, it's done, we're done. We're, we'll, as soon as I put the microphone down, so will we, we be. The advice I would say is anything you write, any, anything, it, two, two in the morning, I'm not staying past two in the morning, the staff doesn't want to stay past two in the morning, we're gonna use that line, stay past two in the morning. You know, stay to 201, because you know that line's not good. And you, you, you know you can put in the mouth of an actor who really wants to, to trust you that you are doing the best for him. Don't sleep, guy who wrote Charles and George. Don't sleep. <laughs> and, and that's the way it's been. <coughs> Um, there was my boy. Josh is, is sitting there in a gray shirt there in the first row, at the end of the row. Uh, Josh lives his life according to Corey Matthews. Um, if, if I say something to Josh, and it is a very deeply important crux moment in his life, before he acts, he will consider what Corey would have done in the situation. I'm proud of that. He won't get hurt. Uh, I, I, I took my time with Corey Matthews, and so did Ben. Um, my kids would far rather listen to an entertainment venue, which is saying exactly what a father would at a dinner table, tolerate it and accept it. And I knew I would reach them in that way. That same Josh came to me, and I realized when he was six years old that he thought I wrote everything on television. He was talking, <laughs> when you watch television, that's my dad, yeah, my dad, that's my dad, that's television. And I, I had to sit him down and I had to tell him that I don't, Josh, I just do a couple of things and, and I'm, I'm part of a wonderful world. And I said, the thing that you need to do, find a show that isn't mine and love that. I can? Yes, okay? And he took about two weeks. And he said, I found one. And I said, okay, what's it about? And he said, and I'm telling you the truth, it's about this little baby dinosaur who says not the mama. 
And I said, well, that's Tim's show. So, so it, to, to, be able, <laughs> to be able to reach your children in such a profound manner, yeah, it's worth having a belief system over that. Well, thank you so much for You're being so here welcome. and everyone for... <laughs>